What's up guys, my name is Ryan and I spent the last few years exploring the incredible continent of Europe and I want to show you my favorite places, so here's my Europe Top 100. I have to say that Europe is my favorite place in the world, from the landscapes of the Alps to the countless medieval cities, it's impossible to beat the beauty of Europe. This video is a long one so I made timestamps of all the places in the description so you can jump around to your favorite places. For our first destination, we're going to head to possibly my favorite place ever, Ceceda. Now located in the Dolomites of Northern Italy, I remember the first time I saw a video of this mountain, I couldn't believe it existed. The green glass slopes contrasted with the jagged mountain ridge, often covered in clouds, makes one of the most beautiful landscape combos. Now to get to Ceceda, I took two gondolas up the mountain and made it to the top. I remember the first time I saw the mountain, I couldn't believe my eyes. The clouds covered half of it, making it one of the best views I've ever gotten. Places like this really spark your imagination and make you feel like a kid again. I hope everyone can witness the power of Ceceda at least once in their life. Another magical place nearby is Alpe de Suisse. It's home to the largest high alpine meadow in Europe. The backdrop of the mountain with the farm cabins creates a scene straight out of a dream. After Northern Italy, let's head over to the mystical Faroe Islands. Located right between Norway and Iceland in the North Atlantic Ocean, the archipelago is made up of 18 volcanic islands. Now I have to say that the Faroes are home to some of the world's most dramatic landscapes, from sheer sea cliffs to waterfalls straight into the ocean. One of the most scenic places in the Faroe Islands is the Mulafusur Waterfall. Now it's located on Vagar Island and the waterfall descends about 100 feet into the ocean below. I mean, the backdrop of the village with a massive green mountain behind makes for one of the most scenic places on Earth. One of my personal favorite places in the Faroe Islands is the Sea Stacks of Dragonir. I mean, the name itself just sounds freaking epic. It's this slanted sea rock with a perfect arch right above the cold Atlantic Ocean. This place looks like a scene out of Game of Thrones. I just can't believe how beautiful the Faroe Islands are. After the Faroe Islands, we're going to Italy to visit the picturesque village of Positano. I have to say that this is one of the most beautiful places in Europe. Located on the Malfi coast, back in the first century, luxury Roman villas were built on the coast here. It was believed to be a home of mythical sirens who would seduce sailors to crash upon the rocky shores. Positano was a somewhat poor fishing village during the first half of the 20th century, but tourism began to gain traction in the 1950s. When you see this place in real life, you won't believe it. It's hard to beat the backdrop of the mountains filled with colorful villas against the Mediterranean Sea with boats and yachts. Positano is quite the touristy destination, but its beauty is worth it. After Positano, we're going to head over to Switzerland to Valle Versasca. Valle Versasca is famous for having this medieval bridge that goes over some of the clearest river water in the world. I remember the first time I got there, I was immediately baffled by the beauty of this place. I mean, the water is crystal clear. You can see all the way to the bottom. The bridge was a prime place to cliff jump, so it took me a while to build up the courage to jump. I was able to throw some of my favorite gainers off the water. I also had an amazing time snorkeling in the water there. I mean, just so clear. It was such a fun memory for me. I mean, it's hard to beat cliff jumping in Switzerland. All right, so after Switzerland, we're going to head over to the Italian coast to visit Cinque Terre. Now, Cinque Terre is made up of five seaside villages that date back to medieval times. During the medieval ages, the villages started to be attacked by pirates, so fortifying walls were built to protect them against any future raids. The small town of Vernaza is one of my favorites. It has the only natural port of Cinque Terre. I just can't get over the colorful houses and beauty of the Cinque Terre. It's hard to beat the charm of these Italian villages. After Cinque Terre, we're going to head over to England's Jurassic Coast. Now, while you won't find any dinosaurs here, you might find some fossils on the beach. One of my favorite spots on the Jurassic Coast is Old Harry Rocks. Now, special thanks to my friend David Rule for providing this footage. He has an awesome Instagram and YouTube that I'll provide in the description below. I remember the first time I saw his picture of this place and I was just baffled by the scenery there. The Old Harry Rocks are these sea stacks that are made completely out of chalk that mark the end of the Jurassic Coast. In World War II, the stack were used as target practice for pilots so that's kind of crazy i just love the combination of the green meadows with the white cliffs and the blue ocean i mean it's just 
hard to beat that scenery. After the Jurassic Coast, we're going to swim across the English Channel to visit the island of Mont Saint Michel. Now, located one kilometer off the coast of France, Mont Saint Michel is one of the most magical destinations in Europe. It reminds me a lot of Hogwarts. The island was first founded by an Irish hermit, and the construction of the monastery began in the 10th century and was finished in 1523. Due to its strategic position and dangerous changing tides, the island remained protected throughout history. During the 15th century, Louis IX decided to turn the monastery into a prison, and it remained one until 1863. Now, Mont Saint Michel is one of France's most popular tourist destinations. If you are in northern France, you really need to visit this magical place. After Mont Saint Michel, we're going to head to southern France to the French Riviera. Now, located on the southeast quarter of France, the French Riviera is home to some of the world's greatest coastline. It's the perfect contrast between mountains and the Mediterranean Ocean. Some of the most beautiful coastal towns of the Riviera include Saint Tropez. Nice and Cannes. Now the French Riviera is also home to the tiny country of Monaco. Monaco is the second smallest country after the Vatican. The whole country is only 499 acres. Monaco has been known as a billionaire's playground and over one third of Monaco's citizens are millionaires. One of the most famous places in Monaco is the Monte Carlosino. It was opened in 1863 and has been featured in the James Bond films. If you can handle the riches of Monte Carlo and Monaco, definitely a place to add to your bucket list. Afterwards, we're going to head over to Norway to visit Lisiboden to drive down one of Europe's craziest roads. What I think is so scenic about Lisiboden is the road which leads down to it. When I first saw the pictures of it, I couldn't believe it. It consists of 27 hairpin turns that descend down the fjord to the village below. After Lisiboden, we're going to head over to the nearby Pulpit Rock. Pulpit Rock is a famous flat top cliff with a straight drop of over 600 meters. Pulpit Rock can get super packed, so if you want to avoid the crowds, you can wake up super early and get to Pulpit Rock to enjoy the sunrise. Another hike to do is the trek to Toltanga. Now, Trolltunga is possibly the most iconic rock formation in Norway as it shoots out over 2,000 feet from the lake below. Trolltunga is definitely the hardest hike of the three. It's a 28 kilometer round trip trek that takes anywhere from 8 to 12 hours to do. While it is a strenuous hike, it offers some of the best views in Norway. After Norway, we're going to head over to Iceland to experience the land of fire and ice. I have to say that Iceland is home to some of the world's most unique landscapes. One of the most visited attractions in Iceland is the Blue Lagoon. Just a short drive from the capital of Reykjavik, Blue Lagoon is famous for its strikingly blue water. It costs about $40 to get in and experience the geothermal spa. One of my personal favorite places in Iceland is the Reynisfjara beach. What I really loved about the beach is the basalt sea stacks in the ocean. It makes you wonder how the Vikings must have felt when they washed up on the Icelandic shores. After Rainy's Fire, you can check out Skogafoss Waterfall. It's one of the most impressive waterfalls in Iceland with a drop of over 60 meters. You can also drive an hour east on the Ring Road and visit one of the most scenic canyons in Iceland. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it looks like something straight out of a fantasy movie. Don't be surprised if you see a troll walking around there. If you drive another three hours down the ring road, you'll reach Stokesness. It's such a dramatic view with the black sand and the mountain in the background. On the other side of Iceland, you can visit Kirkjufelsfoss. It's this uniquely shaped mountain that looks like Gandalf's hat. There's a waterfall nearby and it makes for an incredible shot. If you go in the winter time, you might just get lucky and see the Aurora Borealis. There's just so much to see in Iceland and I hope everyone can see it at least once in their life. After freezing in Iceland, we're gonna head over to Greece to visit my favorite island in the world, Zakynthos. Now I've been there twice so far and I just keep wanting to come back. It's one of the most impressive locations that I've ever been. From a thousand foot white cliffs to the bluest water you've ever seen, Zakynthos has it all. The most famous place in Zakynthos is Shipwreck Beach. Back in the 1980s, a cargo ship from Turkey was carrying illegal contraband and the Greece Navy chased them into this cove where it crashed. Over the years, the sand has built up around the ship and it's created one of the most visually stunning locations in the world. I mean, there's no other place like like it. Another one of my favorite Greek islands is Milos. It's about a five hour boat ride from Athens and one of the most impressive places on Milos is the Kleftiko Caves. You'll have to take a boat to get there. They have these gorgeous white rocks that jet out of the water and the water is just so clear there. Another really cool spot on Milos is the Serakaniko Beach. 
It's a unique place that is made of lava that has been bleached by the sun and sea. I mean, just looking at this footage makes me want to go buy a plane ticket and go there right now. After exploring the islands of Greece, we're going to head over to Russia's St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg is located at the end of the Baltic Sea. It was founded relatively recent in 1703 after Russia captured it from Swedish colonists. Today is one of Russia's most thriving cities and it receives millions of tourists each year. I love all the canals. It reminded me a lot of Amsterdam. One of the most famous spots is the Peter and Paul Fortress. It was the original citadel of St. Peter and was finished in 1740. You can also check out sites such as the Palace Square or many of the city's gorgeous gardens. After St. Petersburg, we're going to head over to Latvia to visit Riga. Now, I have to say that I was very surprised by Riga's beauty. It's full of stunning medieval architecture. Riga was founded back in 1201, and today it's the largest city in all the Baltic countries. One of the most famous buildings is the House of the Blackheads. It's located in Riga's old town and was built in the 14th century. St. Peter's Church is another dramatic building that towers over Riga's skylines. Riga is just such a special and underrated city, and I hope all can visit. After, we're going to head over to the Czech Republic to explore the capital city of Prague. Due to its location and rich history, Prague is known as the political, cultural, and economic center of Europe. One of my favorite attractions is the Charles Bridge. Its construction began in 1357 and it wasn't finished until the beginning of the 15th century. The bridge is decorated with an alley of over 30 statues. I mean, it's just so scenic and such a great feature in Prague. The Old Town Square is also a great place to explore, and the Prague Castle is another beautiful sight to see. It's considered to be the largest ancient castle in the world, and it was built more than a thousand years ago in the 9th century. I mean, that's a freaking long time. Prague has such a historic vibe, and I hope all can visit. Afterwards, we're going to head to the Netherlands to visit Amsterdam. Now, known for its elaborate canal system, narrow houses, and countless bridges, Amsterdam has a vibe like none other. I was in Amsterdam many years ago, and its impression has always left a mark on me. It's just crazy to think that people were able to construct a city around canals hundreds of years ago. Amsterdam originated as a small fishing village in the 12th century and rose to one of the world's most important trading ports in the 17th century. When I was there, I just had an incredible time just walking around the canals and enjoying the atmosphere of this incredible city. After Netherlands, we're going to head over to Budapest. Now located in Hungary, Budapest is one of Europe's most photogenic destinations. The Danube River runs right through Budapest, making it a unique and stunning city. One of my favorite attractions is the Chain Bridge. It's a suspension bridge that runs across the Danube. The Hungarian Parliament Building is another incredible piece of architecture. It was opened in 1902 and it's the third largest Parliament Building in the world. Budapest is also famous for its thermal baths. The Szczeny Thermal Bath is the largest in Europe and it's known for its medicinal properties. After it, we're going to head over to Croatia. Now, I have to say that Croatia is one of the most beautiful countries in all of Europe. One of my favorite places in Croatia is Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik is one of the most popular medieval towns in all of Europe. One of the most notable features in Dubrovnik is the walls that surround the city. They're almost two kilometers in length and anywhere from four to six meters thick. The unique look of the city has made it a popular filming location for series such as Game of Thrones. Now another fascinating city in Croatia is Pula. The city is home to the Pula Arena. It's this perfectly preserved Roman amphitheater that was constructed from 27 BC to 68 AD, and it's the world's sixth largest surviving Roman arena. Now right off the coast of Pula is the Brugini Islands. That's a set of 14 uniquely shaped islands. that have a really distinct look to them. Now if you want to head inland, you can check out the Plitvis Lakes National Park. It's home to some of Europe's most beautiful lakes and waterfalls. They remind me a lot of Bosnia's Karvika waterfalls. You take an electric boat over the water and explore the 16th terraced lakes of the park. There's one walkways to walk and explore. I mean, just such a beautiful place. I can't believe the color of the water there. After Croatia, we're going to head over to Slovenia to visit Ljubljana. Now, while Ljubljana is one of the smallest capitals in Europe with a population of around 300,000, it's one of the most beautiful in my opinion. The crowning feature is the Ljubljana Castle as it overlooks the city. It was built around the 12th century. It's one of the capital's most popular attractions. If you want to venture outside the capital, I'd highly recommend making the hour drive to the fairy tale destination of Lake Bled. It's one of the most beautiful lakes in all of Europe, with a little island and church right in the middle. Another one of my favorite places in Slovenia is the River Socha. This river is over 138 kilometers long and passes through western Slovenia and Italy. It's considered to be one of the most beautiful rivers in all of Europe, and I can totally see why. It has a very distinct emerald color to it. 
that I've never seen before. It's a great place to go kayaking and river rafting. I mean, the river just full of so many rapids, winding turns, and scenic bridges. I can't think of a better place to spend during a hot summer day. After Slovenia, let's head over to Portugal to visit the vibrant city of Lisbon. Being one of the oldest cities in the world, Lisbon is Europe's second oldest capital city after Athens. I mean, there's just so much culture and history in this city. You can check out the Sanctuary of Christ the King Monument. It reminds me of a mixture of Rio de Janeiro and San Francisco's bridge. The Commerce Square is another beautiful spot to explore. One of the coolest parks in Lisbon is the Parque Eduardo VII. It's full of beautifully designed hedges and just a great place to enjoy the afternoon or evening. The Belém Tower is also an important monument that served as a point of embarkation for Portuguese explorers. Lisbon is also close to some stunning beaches such as Ursa Beach. While we're still in Portugal, we're going to head to the Algarve Coast. Located in Portugal's southernmost region, the Algarve Coast is famous for its sea cliffs filled with hidden beaches and sea caves. One really intriguing place is Ponte da Piedade. It's full of countless grottos and sea arches to explore. Such a unique and beautiful area. After Portugal, we're going to head over to Germany to visit the Bavarian Alps. Located in southern Germany, right next to the Austrian border, the Bavarian Alps are home to jaw-dropping scenery. One of the most famous towns is Berchtesgaden. It's just a 30-minute drive from Salzburg. The area is also full of stunning alpine lakes. One of my favorites is Obersee. It's famous for having this little mountain cabin right on the lake. One of the most well-known places in Bavaria is the new Schwanstein Castle. I have to say this is the most beautiful castle in all Europe. It's nestled at the very tip of southern Germany. New Schwanstein Castle is placed perfectly in the mountains with a phenomenal 360 view of the Bavarian Alps and the town below. The construction of the castle began in 1869. The castle receives over 1.4 million visitors a year, so it's definitely a tourist hotspot. I mean, I just can't get over the beauty of this castle. It looks like something straight out of a Disney movie. After, we're going to head to Italy's beautiful region of Tuscany. Now, located in central Italy, Tuscany is known for its landscapes history and artistic legacy. Whenever I think of Tusk, I just imagine rolling green hills with beautiful farm homes lined with skinny cypress trees. It's just hard to beat the beauty there. It would be a prime place to retire. Now the capital of Tuscany is the iconic city of Florence. It's considered to be the birth of the Renaissance. One of the most impressive buildings is the Florence Cathedral. When you look at it, you just can't believe how big it is. It was completed in 1436 and it just amazes me that they were able to engineer such a big dome. The Ponte Vecchio bridge is another historic site as it crosses the Arno River. I just can't say enough good things about Florence. It's such an amazing city with so much history. Another great town in Tuscany is San Gimigiano. San Gimigiano is a stunning medieval city perched upon a hill. One of the most iconic features of the city is the medieval watchtowers. Currently, there are 14 watchtowers still standing, but during the city's prime, there were over 72 towers with the highest up to 230 feet tall. I mean, I just can't imagine how it must have looked back then. I guess you could say it was the Manhattan of the Middle Ages. San Gimigiano's medieval vibe has been untouched throughout time and has become one of the most popular popular medieval locations in Italy. After exploring Tuscany, we're going to head over to Lake Como. Now located about a one and a half hour drive from Milan, Lake Como is a sight to see. Known for its picturesque scenery and luxury villas, Lake Como has been named one of the world's most beautiful lakes and I totally understand why. The lake's beauty has attracted people here since the Roman times. When you go there, you can walk the streets of Bellagio or take a ferry to other lakeside villages. If you're in northern Italy, you gotta check this place out. While we're still in Italy, let's head over to the famous city of Venice. Now, Venice is one of the world's most unique cities. There are no roads and just canals to get around. It's made up of 118 islands, and they are linked by over 400 bridges. Venice was a major financial and maritime power during the medieval ages and the Renaissance, and today it's one of Europe's most popular tourist destinations. When you're there, you can take a ride down the canals on a gondola, or you can check out St. Mark's Square. It's a one-of-a-kind location I hope you all can see. Another one of my favorite places is the magical city of Edinburgh. If you want to go back in time, Edinburgh is a must. It's where J.K. Rowling wrote her Harry Potter novels. 
When I started traveling, this was one of the first cities I visited. It's a medieval town with intricate neoclassical buildings, cobblestone streets, and beautiful gardens. The iconic Edinburgh Castle overlooks the city and it's home to Scotland's crown jewels. One of my favorite places in Edinburgh is Calton Hill that just offers a beautiful view of the entire city. While we're still in Scotland, we're going to visit the Isle of Skye. If you want to feel like you're in a fairy tale, this is where you need to go. I was lucky enough to visit the Isle of Skye last summer. It's about a five hour drive from Edinburgh. Now one of the most impressive places in the Isle of Skye is the Old Man of Store. The legend of the Old Man of Store is supposedly a giant lived there a long time ago and when he was buried, his thumb was left sticking out of the ground creating the mystical rock formation. Now just a few minutes away from the Old Man of Store, there is a breathtaking waterfall called Meowth Falls that cascades down to the ocean. There's a nice viewpoint where you can see the waterfall. If you're looking to find some fairies, you may want to check out the fairy pools. They're these picturesque blue pools that lie at the base of the Black Coolin Mountains. After Scotland, we're going to head over to the charming capital of Dublin. Now located on Ireland's eastern coast, Dublin is a city full of charm. The capital is known for its beautiful gardens and architecture, I mean just such a friendly vibe to it. When you're there, you can take a walk across the River Liffey on the uniquely designed Samuel Beckett Bridge, or you can walk to the coast to experience the Irish Sea. I just love the feel of Dublin, it's just such a magical capital. What's also cool about Dublin is that you can visit most places in the country with a few hours drive. You can make the three hour journey to the Cliffs of Moher on Ireland's west coast, or you can venture two hours to the spooky dark hedges in Northern Ireland. There's just so much to experience. After after Ireland, let's head over to Poland to visit Warsaw. Located on the Vistula River in east central Poland, Warsaw is the capital and largest city in the country. Warsaw began to grow in the 16th century and was called the Paris of the North, but Warsaw was damaged extensively during World War II with 85% of its buildings in ruins. Today it's a bustling capital with a population of 1.8 million. One of my favorite buildings is the Palace of Culture and Science. At 778 feet tall, it's the fifth tallest building in the EU. If you want to see some medieval vibes, you can check out Warsaw's Old Town. It was established in the 13th century as full of history and medieval architecture. While we're still in Poland, we're going to head down to Krakow. Located in southern Poland, Krakow was founded back in the 7th century, so you best believe it's full of beautiful history and architecture. One of the most impressive sites is the Walwo Royal Castle. It was built during the 14th century and was the first UNESCO World Heritage Site. It features architectural styles from the medieval, renaissance, and baroque periods. Such a beautiful building. If you're into World War II history, you can make the hour drive to the Memorial of Auschwitz concentration camps. Auschwitz is infamously known as one of the most horrific Nazi concentration camps. Over 1.1 million people died here. So it's such a tragedy. One of my favorite books I've ever read is called The Auschwitz Escape and it tells the story of how two prisoners made the daring escape from the prison camp and also really just gives you perspective of what it was like to live in that camp. Just absolutely horrific. After Poland, we're going to head back to the Baltics to visit Lithuania's capital of Vilnius. Unlike other Baltic capitals of Tallinn and Riga, Vilnius is located inland near its eastern border. Before World War II, Vilnius was one of the largest Jewish centers in the world. Napoleon called it the Jerusalem of the North. I'm just blown away by the beauty of the city and its perfect mixture of modern and Baroque architecture. You can drive 30 minutes outside the city and visit the Trakai Island Castle. It's this uniquely designed castle that's on a little island in Lake Gulf. Such a cool little spot outside the city. After Lithuania, we're going to head down to Austria to visit the capital of Vienna. Now, Vienna has been ranked one of the world's most livable cities. Vienna is known as the city of music. Musicians such as Beethoven and Mozart called Vienna their home. One of the most impressive places is the Schönbrunn Palace. There are stunning gardens and mazes to explore around the palace. If you want to visit the Austrian Alps, you can head over to the picturesque village of Hallstatt. This town looks like it should be in a fairy tale because it's so magical. It was once a salt mining town, but now it's one of Austria's most popular popular tourist attractions. After Austria, we're going to head over to France to the capital of Paris. Now since the 17th century, Paris has been Europe's major center of finance, diplomacy, fashion, and the arts. Paris is one of the world's most visited cities and with all its attractions and fascinating history, it's easy to see why. Paris's most recognizable attraction is the Eiffel Tower. It was built in 1889 for the World Fair. The Eiffel Tower is 324 meter high. 
which made it the tallest man-made structure in the world until 1930. You can take an hour up there to get an incredible 360 panoramic view of all of Paris. Another popular attraction is the Louvre Museum. It's the world's largest art museum and it's home to Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. You can also take a drive around the Arc de Triomphe or walk the grounds of the Palace of Versailles. And there's just so much to see in this grand city. If you want a road trip outside the capital, you can head to France's northern coast, visit the coastal town of Etretat, located about three hours outside of Paris. Etretat is famous for its white cliffs and rock formations. One of the most well-known is the Falaise de Aval Arch. It has such a unique shape. I guess you could say they are the French cousins of old hairy rocks. While we're still in France, we're going to head to the French Alps. The French Alps are home to Mount Blanc, which is the highest mountain in all of the Alps at 15,774 feet. The border between France and Italy passes right through the summit, making it both French and Italian. One thing that I think that is cool about Mount Blanc is the glaciers that run down from it. And there are also a lot of beautiful alpine lakes that offer incredible views of the French Alps. After, we're going to head to Switzerland to visit the village of Grindelwald. I was lucky enough to live in Switzerland, and on my last week living there, I did a road trip to Grindelwald to see what the hype was about. When I got there, I was awestruck by Mount Eiger. It's the biggest mountain I've ever seen. I wanted to do a hike that would give me a great vantage point of Mount Eiger, but I didn't know the area that well, so I just saw this random peak, so I decided to hike straight up the mountain. When I reached the top, I had the whole peak to myself, and I was rewarded with an incredible view of Mount Eiger. It was just such a memorable experience. After Grindelwald, we're going to head over to the mountains of Appenzell. Now located in eastern Switzerland, these mountains quickly became one of my favorite places I've ever been. It's home to massive jagged mountains that look like something out of Lord of the Rings. Now to get up to the mountain I took a gondola up to the top and then I hiked about an hour to reach a hotel on the top of the mountain. Now me and my buddy Danny decided to stay the night at this hotel so we could watch the sunset. Well, now we got all settled in and then we ventured off to get the perfect spot. The clouds were covering the sky so we only had about 15 minutes of sunlight to get the shot. Now my buddy Danny he whipped out his FPV drone and got some of the most incredible shots I've ever seen. I mean I was just standing on the peak and he'd find the drone over me with the sunset in the background. It goes down as one of the top five sunsets of my life. Another one of my favorite places in Switzerland is Zermatt. Zermatt is home to the most iconic mountain in the Alps, the Matterhorn. With a height of 14,692 feet, it's one of the highest peaks in the Alps. There are many different hikes you can do around the area to get different views of the Matterhorn. If you're an early riser, I'd suggest getting up for sunrise to watch the morning light kiss the top of the Matterhorn as the sun rises over the horizon. Zermatt is a really unique city because they don't allow cars or motorized vehicles. So I had to take a train to get there. When I reached the city, I just had a great time exploring. I also found a McDonald's there, so that was kind of funny. Another one of my favorite places in Switzerland is Young for Rock otherwise known as the top of Europe. So me and my friends decided to take Europe's highest train. Now normally a ticket during summer is around $240, but we got the early bird special, so it was half off. We went up to the very top. When you get off the train, you get into like these cave tunnels. We made it out to the ice plateau and we're able to get an incredible view of the glacier below. After we went to the top of the Sphinx Observatory to get some more amazing views. One of the coolest parts of Young Freyak is the glacier tunnels. You're able to walk through these tunnels carved right out of the ice. While a trip to Young Faryak is expensive, I definitely recommend that everyone try it at least once in their life. After exploring the Swiss Alps, we're gonna head to Finland. Now the capital of Finland is Helsinki, and it's been ranked as one of the happiest and most livable cities in the world. Helsinki is one of the northernmost metropolitan areas, and the whole city just has a great vibe to it. I would love to spend Christmas here. If you want to see some of Finland's nature, you can head up north to visit Lapland. Now, Lapland is Finland's northernmost region and it borders Russia, Sweden, and Norway. In the winter months, Lapland becomes a frozen wonderland that looks like something straight out of a Disney movie. Now, if you can handle the cold, Lapland may be one of the best places in the world to see the northern lights. The northern lights are abundant throughout the cold winter months. It can get up to negative 50 degrees Celsius in the winters, so make sure you bundle up. One thing I love about Lapland is the snow-covered trees. They look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. In the summertime, Lapland becomes a peaceful area with wildlife and endless nature. I really just want to spend some time in Finland, relaxing in a sauna and seeing for myself why Finland is the happiest country in the world. 
After Finland, we're going to head over to Sweden to visit the capital of Stockholm. It's made up of 14 islands and 50 bridges. Compared to other Nordic countries such as Norway and Iceland, I felt Sweden was much more affordable. I just love the buildings and architecture there. It reminded me a lot of Copenhagen with its colorful buildings and canals full of wooden ships. I mean, it's just such a wonderful city and I think everyone should give it a visit. Afterwards, we're going to Belgium to visit the medieval city of Bruges. Due to its tidal inlets and canals, Bruges is sometimes referred to as the Venice of the North. Bruges tidal inlet helped it become one of the most prosperous cities during the Middle Ages as it quickly became a strategic location for maritime trade routes. Today most of Bruges medieval structures have remained intact. One of my favorite features of the city is the market square. It's towered over by a 277 foot medieval bell tower of Belfry which was constructed in the 13th century. Just such an impressive and unique medieval city. After Belgium we're going to head over to the German village of Rothenburg. When you go to Rothenburg, you feel like you're walking into a fantasy movie. It's one of the most preserved medieval towns in Europe. During the Middle Ages, Rothenburg thrived as it was located at the crossroads of the European trade routes. At the beginning of the 15th century, it rose to become the second largest city in Germany. But during the 17th century, Rothenburg faced adversities such as the Thirty Years' War and the Bubonic Plague. Without much resources, Rothenburg's growth was halted, which aided in keeping the town preserved in its medieval state. Today, Rothenburg maintains its medieval charm. It's been the inspiration for Disney movies such as Pinocchio and Beauty and the Beast. If you can, go check out the famous Plonin Corner or the Christmas Market. It's hard to beat the allure of this German village. After Rothenburg, we're going to visit possibly the most iconic city in the world, London. I love the city so much, I just keep coming back. Everything from double-decker buses to the energy of Piccadilly Circus makes the city feel so alive. There's just so many places to see. You can check out the iconic Big Ben and walk across the bridge to see the Palace of Westminster. There's the Tower Bridge, which is possibly the most famous bridge in all London. You can go see the Stoic Guards at Buckingham Palace or take a ride on the London Eye. If you haven't already been to London, I highly recommend visiting when you can it's hard to beat the London atmosphere there's no city like it in the world all right so after exploring London we're gonna make the two-hour drive over to Stonehenge located in Wiltshire England lies one of the most famous man-made rock structures in the world there's a lot of mystery surrounding Stonehenge like what was its purpose and how was it made archaeologists believe it was constructed back between 3000 to 2000 BC Stonehenge consists of a ring of rocks each being around 13 feet high and weighing nearly 25 tons each. It's unclear what the exact purpose of Stonehenge was. It's believed that it was used as an astronomical observatory or a religious site. Either way, it sure makes you stop and think how people thousands of years ago were able to construct this. After Stonehenge, we're going to head over to visit Wells. Now, Wells is located in the southwest part of Great Britain. It's famous for its mountainous national parks, picturesque coastline, and distinct Welsh language. One of the most scenic places in Wells is the Snowdonia National Park. It's a region in northwest Wells that is known for its mountains and lakes. The highest peak in Wells, Mount Snowdon, is located in the park with an elevation of 1,085 meters. You can hike on up there or you can take the Snowdon Mountain Railway to the top. If you're lucky, you might be able to see Ireland across the sea. After Wells, we're going to head back to Switzerland to explore Lucerne. Located in the heart of Switzerland, Lucerne is a picturesque lake city surrounded by the Swiss Alps. It's just a short 40 minute drive from Zurich. One of my favorite parts of Lucerne is all of its medieval buildings and architecture. Lucerne is home to Chapel Bridge, which is the world's oldest surviving truss bridge. It was built over 600 years ago in 1365. It almost burnt down in 1993, but it was reconstructed and it's now open to the public. Another impressive place in Lucerne is the Museg Wall and Towers. The fortifications began in the 13th century and it's made up of nine stone towers that were used as a defense wall during medieval times. Aside from all the history, Lucerne is just a beautiful city to walk around and explore the lake and all the surrounding scenery. While we're still in Switzerland, we're going to head over to the capital of Bern. Now in my opinion, I think Bern is one of Europe's most beautiful capitals. I love how the blue waters of the Ara River wind perfectly through the city. Now Bern's origins date back to the 12th century and today the capital hosts a 
population of just over 1 million people. Now one of the most impressive places in Bern is the old city. It's the medieval part of Bern. One of the most prominent features is the Cathedral of Bern. It started construction in 1421 and it's the tallest cathedral in all of Switzerland at a height of 100 meters. Bern is just such a wonderful city and I hope you all can visit one day. Another one of my favorite capitals is Denmark's Copenhagen. Now Copenhagen started as a Viking fishing village in the 10th century. Today Copenhagen is the cultural, economic, and governmental center of Denmark. One of the most recognizable places in Copenhagen is the Newhauen Canal. It's a 17th century canal that is lined with beautifully colored houses and historical wooden ships. It's just a great place to walk around and enjoy some Danish restaurants and cafes. Another impressive spot in the city is the Copenhagen Opera House. It's one of the most modern and expensive opera houses ever built with an estimated cost of $500 million. Copenhagen is just such a great city to walk around and explore all the hidden treasures. After Denmark, let's head over to the beautiful city of Tallinn. Located in Estonia on the coast of the Baltic Sea, Tallinn received its city rights in the year 1248 and during medieval times it quickly became a major trading hub due to its strategic positioning. As for the city, one of the most impressive places is Tallinn's Old Town. It's one of Europe's most well-preserved medieval cities. I just love all the buildings and architecture there. Tallinn was also just featured in Christopher Nolan's new film Tenet. If you haven't seen that yet, your mind's gonna be blown. Anyways, if you wanna visit one of Europe's most trending cities, you have to give Tallinn a visit. After it, we're going to visit Montenegro's coastal town of Kotor. Located in what some consider to be Europe's southernmost fjord, Kotor is one of the most well-preserved medieval old towns in all the Balkans. It's grown in popularity over the years and it's a popular cruise ship stop. If you want to get one of the best views of Kotor, you can drive up the Serpentine Road to get a panoramic view of the entire bay and surrounding mountains. I mean, just what a beautiful city. From Kotor, you can make the 30 minute drive over to the nearby islet of Saveti Stefan. It's this 15th century island fortress that has been converted to a five star luxury resort. If you can afford it, it would be quite the place to stay. While we're still in Montenegro, we're going to check out the Durdavika Tata Bridge. This is one of the coolest arch bridges that I've ever seen. The bridge was finished in 1940 and it consists of five arches with its highest being over 564 feet above the river below. I mean, just such a crazy looking bridge. All right, after Montenegro, we're gonna head over to the neighboring country of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Known for its beautiful rivers, medieval bridges, and fascinating history, it's quite the place to visit. Now, one of my favorite places in the country is the city of Mostar. The most popular feature of the city is the Old Bridge. It's an Ottoman bridge from the 16th century. It stood for 427 years until it was destroyed in 19. 1983 during the Croat Bosniak War, but in 2004 it was rebuilt. Another really cool spot in Bosnia is the Kravika Waterfalls. Only a 40 minute drive from Mostar, the Kravika Waterfalls are home to an incredible amphitheater of cascading waterfalls with some as high as 25 meters tall. What's cool is they let you swim there, so it's just a great place to spend during the warm summer months. Afterwards, we're going to head over to Greece to visit the medieval monasteries of Meteora. Located in central Greece, Meteora is home to six monasteries built upon nearly inaccessible rock pillars. During the 14th century, monks were facing attacks from Turkish raiders, so they needed a place where they could worship in safety. They decided to start building the monasteries upon the rocks. These places of worship were perfect for their monks because the only way to reach them was by climbing long ladders. The monasteries became a place of refuge and over 20 monasteries were built during the 14th century. I was lucky enough to go here a few years ago. When I got there I was just amazed by the architecture of these monasteries. They are perched perfectly on the cliff edge and you wonder how people could have built these in the medieval times. If you're ever in Greece make sure you visit this magical place. Another incredible spot in northern Greece is Mount Olympus or otherwise known as the mythical mountain of the gods. At 9,570 feet high, it's the highest mountain in all of Greece. According to Greek mythology, this is where Zeus and other Greek gods resided. If you wanna hike the mountain of the gods, it's recommended to do the hike in two to three days, and I'd recommend having a guide because it can be quite dangerous and a confusing hike. While we're still in Greece, we're gonna head over to the iconic city of Athens, it's the capital and largest city in Greece, and it's one of the world's oldest cities. Athens is such a wild place with so much history. One of my favorite places in Athens is the Acropolis. 
If you want to get into Parthenon, it costs about 20 euros, so it's a little expensive, but it's totally worth it, especially if you're there. When I went to the Acropolis, I was able to get some of my favorite time lapses over the city. They're just an endless sea of white buildings with mountains in the background. If you do go to Greece, I recommend exploring Athens for at least a day or two. It's just such a unique place. After, we're going to head over to Bulgaria to visit Sofia. Located in western Bulgaria, Sofia is the country's capital. One of the most famous places in Sofia is the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral was completed in 1912. I love the gold-plated dome roofs. It has just such a unique look to it. While we're still in Bulgaria, we're going to head over to the east coast to visit Varna. Now, Varna is located right on the coast of the Black Sea. I went there last summer to film a video for a hotel, and I had no expectations, but I was pleasantly surprised by its beauty and history. It reminded me a lot of California's coastline. It had great beaches, wonderful weather, with tons of entertainment. Now, another interesting spot in Bulgaria is the Belogradchik Fortress. It's located in the Balkan Mountains. It's this ancient fortress among some really unique rock formations. The fortress was captured by the Ottomans in the 14th century. The thing that strikes me about the area is how they incorporated the rocks into the fortresses. I mean, just such a unique place. I've never seen anything like it. After Bulgaria, we're going to head up north to Romania to visit the medieval castles of Transylvania. Now, Transylvania is a very intriguing yet spooky region. Transylvania is where Ram Stoker's novel Count Dracula takes place. Now, one of the most famous locations in Transylvania is the Rand Castle. Located near the city of Brasov, the castle was built around the 14th century and served as a fortification against the Ottoman Empire. Due to its dramatic architecture and possible connection to Vlad the Impaler, the castle has been named Dracula's Castle. I could totally imagine Count Dracula using this castle as his hideout. Now, Romania is also home to this really cool road called the Transfiguration Road. It's full of hairpin turns and it's easy to see why it's one of the most popular roads in in all Europe. After Romania, let's head back to Norway to visit the Lofoten Islands. Lofoten is located in northern Norway, and even though it's in the Arctic Circle, it feels like you're on a tropical island there. I was lucky enough to go there about two summers ago, and I had an incredible journey road tripping through Lofoten. Our first pit stop was at this fishing village called Henningsjar to see the real most scenic football field. When we got there, we sadly didn't have a soccer ball, but we had a good time playing on the field and enjoying the incredible views of Henningsvar. We kept on driving and made it to the iconic town of Rain. Now when you think of Norway, this is it. It has those red houses surrounded by massive sea mountains. In my opinion, I'd have to say that Rain is the most beautiful town in Lofoten. When I was planning my road to Norway, I remember seeing pictures of this place and I just couldn't believe it existed. After Lofoten, we're gonna head to Saltstrumen to witness one of the world's largest whirlpools. So over 110 billion gallons of water pass through this three kilometer straight heavy six hours, making for one of the strongest currents in the world. Now water speeds can reach over 37 kilometers one of the coolest features of South Strumman is the whirlpools that the changing tides make. Now, while they aren't the whirlpools you'd imagine in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, these whirlpools can get over 33 feet in diameter with a depth of over 16 feet. You can take a boat ride through the current or you can witness the whirlpools from the bridge above. After the whirlpools, we're going to take a drive to one of Norway's most famous routes, the Atlantic Ocean Road. This 8.3 kilometer road runs across an archipelago of islands as it connects the islands of Averroi to the Romsdal Peninsula. The Atlantic Ocean Road was completed in 1989 and cost 122 million Norwegian Krone to make. It's made up of eight bridges and four resting places. The route is an impressive feat of engineering and it won the Norwegian Construction of the Century Award. So if you decide to go on a Norway road trip, you have to take a drive on the Atlantic Ocean Road. While we're still on the topic of roads, if you drive just two hours south, you'll reach another one of Norway's most famous routes, Trollstigen. Now Trollstigen, or the Trolls Path, is a serpentine road that makes over 11 hairpin turns as it descends on a 10% decline to the valley below. Trostegen has two powerful waterfalls that pass through the road. The Stigfosen waterfall has a total height of 240 meters. I mean, that's just freaking huge. Another really cool place in the area is Trollvengen, or the Trolls Wall. It's Europe's tallest vertical overhanging rock face at about 3,600 feet high. I mean, it's just unbelievable. All right, after Trollstigen, you can make the two hour drive south to visit the Geringer Fjord. Now, Geringer Fjord is one of Norway's most popular destinations. The fjord is over 260 meters deep and is surrounded by massive mountains that are over 1600 meters high. 
There are many viewpoints to get the best perspective of the fjord. One of the most spectacular features of Geringer Fjord is the Seven Sisters Waterfall. The waterfall consists of seven separate streams that descend 410 meters to the water below. The best way to see the fjord is by boat. You can take a cruise ship or a one hour ferry of Geringer to Helisilt for about $35. This is by far the best way to witness the waterfalls and majesty of the fjord. After exploring the fjords, we're going to head back to the Arctic Circle to visit one of the most northern places in all of Europe, Svalbard. Now Svalbard is located right between the North Pole and Norway. The capital of Svalbard is this town called Longyearbyen, which has a population of a whopping 2,000 people. What's cool about Svalbard is that it's a visa-free zone, so basically anyone can move and work there. The archipelago is also home to the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, where thousands of the real seeds are kept in case of a global catastrophe. After Svalbard, we're going to head over to Russia to visit Moscow. Moscow is the world's most northernmost and coldest mega city. It's also Europe's second most popular city with over 12.4 million residents. One of the coolest places in Moscow is St. Basil's Cathedral. It was completed in 1561 under orders of Ivan the Terrible. It has such a unique look with its colorful onion shaped domes. Right next to the cathedral is the Moscow Kremlin. It's a fortified complex that was completed in 1495. It serves as the official residence of Vladimir Putin so it's basically the Russian equivalent of the White House. One of the most stunning buildings in my opinion is the Moscow State University. It reminds me of a scene straight out of a Batman movie. I mean there's just so many intriguing places to visit in Moscow. What a wild place. Russia is also home to the tallest mountain in Europe, Mount Elbrus. Located in southwestern Russia stands this massive 18,510 foot high stratovolcano. It's the 10th most prominent peak in the world. Now it's a dormant volcano with two peaks. I mean the mountains in the area remind me a lot of the Swiss Alps. I just can't believe how big they are. So if you want to hike to the top of Mount Elbrus, climbing isn't very technical. You're mostly walking with crampons on snow to the top, but the climb can be very challenging due to altitude and unpredictable weather. A lot of people compare its difficulty to climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. While I've never been to Russia, I'd love to summit this mountain one day. I just think it would be such an adventure. Afterwards, we're going to head over to Turkey to visit the notorious city of Istanbul. Istanbul is one of the most fascinating places. It's a transcontinental city, which means that Istanbul is part of both Europe and Asia. The Bosphorus Strait, which is considered to be the boundary between Europe and Asia, runs right through the capital. Istanbul is the most populated city of all of Europe with a population of over 15 million. The history of Istanbul is endless. It was settled as far back as 7th century BC and it became the capital of the Roman Empire in the year 330 AD. One of my favorite features of the city is the Galita Tower. It's a uniquely shaped medieval building that dominates the skyline. It was built in 1348 and the tower was used to spot fires. One of the most important features of Istanbul is the Hagia Sophia. It was built all the way back in the year 537 AD as a Christian church. But after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the church was converted to a mosque by the Ottoman Empire. At the time of its completion, it was the world's largest interior space and the first building to use a fully pendative dome. I mean, just such an amazing structure. After, we're going to visit the famous city of Barcelona. Now when you think of Spain, this is what you probably imagine. Barcelona is home to incredible architecture, Mediterranean beaches, and an energetic vibe all around. The most iconic attraction in Barcelona is La Sagrada Familia. It's this Roman Catholic minor basilica that began construction over 138 years ago and it still isn't finished. It's anticipated that construction will be finished in 2026, but who knows? All I know is one of the most unique buildings in the world and I still can't get my head around that it's been construction since 1882. After Barcelona, we're going to head over to the wild island of Ibiza. Now while Ibiza is known for crazy nightlife and party city, it also has some of the world's best beaches and cliff jumping. Me and my brother decided to go to Ibiza for Halloween because why not? Anyways, we spent the first few days exploring the island and honestly, I was pretty disappointed because I couldn't find any really cool cliff jump spots but on our last day we had just a few hours before our plane was about to take off and we found this secluded cove we hiked down and made sure the water was deep enough and we found this perfect cliff and I threw some jumps off 
and then my brother did a wild double backflip off the cliff. Another incredible place in Spain is the volcanic Canary Islands. Now located off the coast of northwestern Africa, Canary Islands are home to some of the world's most unique landscapes. You might as well call them the Hawaiian Islands of Europe because that's what they remind me of. The biggest and most populated island on the archipelago is called Tenerife. One of the craziest places in Tenerife is the Cliffs of Los Gigantes. They are these massive sheer cliff walls that rise 800 meters out of the ocean. While we're still in the Atlantic Ocean, we're going to head over to Portugal's archipelago of the Azores. Located right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the Azores are a group of nine islands like none other. They remind me of a hybrid between New Zealand and Hawaii with its rolling pastures and green scenery. The largest island on the Azores is Sao Miguel. One of the most stunning places on the island is Lago das Sete Ciudades. It's a twin lake situated in the crater of a volcano. The highest point in the Azores and all of Portugal is the massive Mount Pico. The straddle volcano is over 7,713 feet high and last erupted in 1720. While we're still in Portugal, we're going to head over to the island of Madeira. Located off the northwest coast of Africa, Madeira is an archipelago of four islands. It was claimed by Portugal in 1419. Madeira is known for its idle climate rugged mountains and also the birthplace of Cristiano Ronaldo. One of the coolest places in Madeira is Pico do Arriero. It's Madeira's third highest peak. The weather on top can be quite unpredictable. You might get lucky and be above the clouds. After we're going to head to the second largest island in the Mediterranean, Sardinia. Now with some of Europe's best coastline, pristine beaches, and the clearest water you've ever seen, Sardinia is the place to be. One of the most impressive places on Sardinia is the Baunai coast. It isn't the easiest place to reach. Most beaches require a long hike or a trip by boat, but that's what makes it so special. After Sardinia, we're going to head back to Italy's mainland to visit the capital of Rome. Now Rome may be the most famous and iconic capital in the world. Its history spans over 28 centuries with its founding taking place in the year 1753 BC. During ancient times, Rome's population peaked around 1 million people. It's just crazy to think that a city was so advanced that it could support so many people during that time. Ancient Rome's architecture stands today and draws millions of tourists each year. One of the most well-known structures of the capital is the Colosseum. It's the largest amphitheater built at its time and could hold anywhere from 50 to 80,000 spectators. You can marvel its architecture from the outside or take a guided tour to witness the interior. One of my personal favorite attractions in Rome is the Trevi Fountain. It's this Baroque style fountain that was completed in 1762. If you go, the earlier the better because you can get super crowded there. While we're still in Italy, we're going to head over to the nearby San Marino. The Republic of San Marino is a microstate completely enclosed by Italy. The history of this small country is absolutely fascinating. It was founded by a stonemason from Croatia named St. Marinus. After facing persecution for his Christian sermons, he fled to the mountain of Monte Titano where he built a church and founded the small country in the year 301 AD. San Marino claims to be the oldest surviving sovereign state and the oldest constitutional republic. The capital of the country is the city of San Marino and it's situated on the slopes of Monte Titano. It's hard to beat the location of the city. One of the most iconic spots in San Marino is the fortress of Guaita. It was built in the 11th century and served as a prison. San Marino is just such a beautiful yet interesting city and country and I hope you all can visit. Alright for our final location we're going to head back to northern Norway to visit Senja. Now Senja is Norway's second largest island. The reason I wanted to go to Senja was because I wanted to hike to Segla. Anyways, I drove to this town called Fjordard and I got to the base of the hike. It was a surprisingly difficult hike, but eventually I made it to the top and I was just baffled by the view. The rock formation rose hundreds of meters out of the ocean. It was just like nothing I've ever seen before. Now I was just having an amazing time and I decided I wanted to spend the night on top of the mountain so I could see the northern lights. All I had was a blanket and I used my camera bag as a pillar so I found this little mossy cliff ledge and I set up camp there and waited for the northern lights to show up. Around 11 p.m. I woke up to the aurora borealis above my head. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. They moved surprisingly fast like snakes in the arctic sky and seeing those lights made me feel like a kid again and it will forever be one of the most special nights of my life. Some nights you don't need to fall asleep to start dreaming. 
Well, that is it for my Europe Top 100. Let me know in the comments where your favorite place is in Europe. I mean, there's just so many beautiful attractions. I could probably do a Top 1000 video. If you guys want to feel relaxed, I started a relaxation channel where I post hour-long videos of places such as Switzerland and Scotland with calming music that you can just have playing in the background to bring some peace and nature in your life. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Shirley.Films. Anyways, it's Ryan, and we will see you later.